Last week, we began this course by giving you a scriptural base for the minister of healing, and we wanted to just explain three basics. Let me just recap quickly for you. Number one, that our textbook, Healing the Sick, published by Harrison House in Tulsa, Oklahoma, has been called a living classic. And I'm sure they call it that because it stood the test. We wrote it back in 1949 and 1950, and it's remain practically unedited all of these years. God's Spirit was on us in such a wonderful way as these truths became fresh to us that we felt to leave it like it was written when it was fresh from God. You know, there's nothing as beautiful as truth when it's fresh to you. And I appealed to you last week as you exercise your minister of healing, never forget to give the people to whom you minister the same courtesy that God is giving you. Share with them the truths that have turned you on. You can't expect to just go out blase and start praying for people and helping people. You must bring them step by step, bring them over the truths that have brought you to faith, and then you'll have success. And that's what God wants. Now, the other thing that I shared in our opening session was just a few remarks about our own self, who we are, sharing with you in this class for over 33 years, see. We've gone all over the world ministering to the masses of people in almost 70 different countries, preaching to the masses. And it's possible that Daisy, my wife, and I have witnessed in our meetings more great healing miracles than any couple on earth who ever lived. I don't say that to brag. It would have happened to you if you'd have been where we were. God did it. It's his truth that does it. Someone says, oh, you must have terrific faith. Oh, what great faith. No, that's not the point at all. We just had the privilege of sharing the truth of God's word with so many hurting people. If you planted a lot of wheat on a lot of big fields and produced a lot of big harvests, it'd be kind of silly for people to come up and say, Oh, Mr. Farmer, you have such great faith in wheat seed. He'd say, Nonsense. I just planted lots of it in lots of ground. I believe God does big business. So Daisy and I have been privileged to just plant a lot of the word in a lot of people. Now, last week we shared with you the introductory page nine of this book, plus some basics of scripture. Today, I want to give you, still forming our foundation for this study, I want to give you some reasons why we can believe the Bible and act on it. I was very fortunate to have grown up in the home where the Bible was respected, revered really. My people were not church-going people, but there was something about what my father taught us. We were 13 children on a farm in Oklahoma, poor. My father taught us. Some way, I say he taught us, I never heard him say it. But there was something in the atmosphere of our home that I grew up believing that if it was said in the Bible, it was true. And I thank God for that. Because today, young people are not growing up in that ambiance. So it's my prayer that I'll be able to give you enough testimony corroborating the scriptures that we share with you in this course, that you will gain a faith in the Word of God. Now, as I say, this is introductory yet. Next week, we'll be getting into the meat of this book. But I want to share five basic, non-theological reasons for believing the Bible. You say, why non-theological? Because, to be real frank, I'm just not very interested in theology or theologians. 
You say, well, any preacher's theologian. Yeah, in a sense, in the sense that I mean it, though. Someone that's always nitpicking on the commas and the periods and crossing the T's and dotting the I's of what was said in the 16th century translation of the English version of the Bible, that just doesn't interest me very much. I'm interested in the essence of truth. In other words, as my wife Daisy puts it, know God, know your father's character, and nobody can lie to you about him. They may tell you all sorts of things about God, but when you find out how good God is, a lot of this stuff that's being fed to people today, you'll turn it off easy. You'll say, I know my father better than that. Come along and tell you healing's not for everybody. You know sickness is God's blessing and it'll teach you things and all this holy stuff about healing. And you'll say, my father don't work that way. So the essence of truth is what I'm interested in. I want to share with you some ideas along that line to really, really go out there and succeed in life with God. You got to have faith. Hebrews 11, verse 3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear, and so forth. Verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please God. He that cometh to God must believe two things, that God is and that God's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So I want to spend my life urging people to seek the Lord and I want to give them the promises of God so they can base their faith on it. And once they believe God is, and then they know what God says, and then they will act on what God says, then you're in business with God in big kingdom business. So to go out there and succeed, you must have faith in his word. In the Bible, as the inspired word of God. Now, these five points that I want to share with you, it's sort of strange for me to say in this Bible institute, Bible training, that I would open it with five non-theological points that I am not going to take a bunch of scriptures and corroborate. But the reason I'm going to do it, we're going to be dealing with scriptures all the way through, but I want you to think. And the Lord impressed me to share these. You know, God give us common sense. And a lot of people get their brain full with a lot of indoctrinization that doesn't make sense. God's pretty smart. He's no dummy. He made me. I'm pretty sharp. He's a heap sharper than me. Are you? He makes sense. Now think about this a little bit. This may help you, many of you, in a very personal way. Back behind the facade, this may help you overcome some lingering questions. How do I really know? But if not you, take good notes on it because it'll help you help multitudes of people out there that are grappling with these simple basic questions. You go out there and preach, you take that Bible. You can't go out there and start shouting that Bible at them. Someone's going to say to you what those Hindus and Muslims said to me in India. We don't believe that. When they said that to me as a young missionary in India, I come unglued. I said, well, you mean you don't believe that? I thought any dummy knew the Bible was the word of God. Well, a few decades ago, a few years ago, practically everybody in America believed the Bible was the word of God, but not today. In your country, where you're at, right here, not today. And when you go out there, we got to have something to get people to believe this. Of course, that's miracles. And that's what we're going to learn. But we've got to have a deep inner conviction that what we're giving the world is solid. So that's why I share some of these things with you. I was inspired to lay them out for ordinary people. 
I'm not interested in trying to convince a theologian of anything. God bless all the theologians. I'm not mad at anybody. But I mean, once a person makes up his mind about things, I haven't got patience to try to change him. I want him to be happy if he likes it. Let him like it. But if you're young and not indoctrinated and not set in your ways, then these things are going to encourage you. You know, religion is mean. You can't rationalize with religion. Christ raised Lazarus from the dead. And the religious people, four days he had been dead. The religious people said, let's kill him. Let's kill Jesus. We got to kill him. The Bible says they took counsel to kill him. Can you believe that? That's religion. Religion can be mean. It always has been bitter, vindicative. Their control over the minds of the people was more important than the wonder of a man that was rotting. And Jesus raised him from the dead. And there he was. You'd have thought anybody would have said, Oh, the wonder of God. Not theologians. That don't mean every theologians like that. Not religion, I should say. You understand religion. I always use the word religion, and in my mind I have quotes around it. <laughs> I'm not talking about Christianity. I'm not talking about the Jesus land. I'm talking about rules and ceremonies and indoctrinization and regimentation and rituals. They took counsel to kill him. That tell you anything? Now don't be surprised when you go out and religionists get all over you. Don't fight back. Keep loving and keep on raising people from the dead. <laughs> Just keep on going. They got a problem, it's their problem. You're happy. You haven't got a problem. You'll never convince them. Don't spend your time trying to convince them. Go on and do your thing. Love and help people. So these five points will only help you if you want to believe the Bible is true. And isn't that terrific for you to be there? And you want, you're yearning, and boy, you're going to get it. Number one, I believe the Bible is true because of its own contents. It's an impeccable record of history, prophecy, government, poetry, wisdom, law, counsel, principle, and faith. It's so wholesome. It's been tested for 19 centuries. History has no record of any person or society who ever attempted to improve it. Not a shred of archaeological evidence has yet contradicted it, but only put to shame those who have ridiculed it. The more I read it, the more I believe it. Scientists who doubt it cannot prove its error. To the contrary, every new scientific discovery was already corroborated by the Bible. It had it before they found it. And every new thing we discover is already there. Scientists have made innumerable errors. It's sort of humorous when you think about it. Until a few hundred years ago, they believed that the earth was flat. Argued it. Well, it's not, is it? <laughs> they could be wrong again about some things. The Bible's not wrong. As late as 1890, a great technician was heard to say, a mechanical technician, he was heard to say, common sense tells you that if a car is built to travel 50 miles an hour, the driver wouldn't be able to get his breath. <laughs> as late as 1890, that's not long ago. Not very long ago. Did you hear? Not very long ago. High blood pressure was treated by draining your blood. You got the pressure up, 
you let the blood out. First Peter 1 Peter 1.25 But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you and to them that you're going to preach to and minister to. Okay. Now that's very simple. That's non-theological. I said... I believe the Bible because of its contents. It just works. Nobody's ever proven it wrong. It just works. Number two, I believe the Bible's true because of the witness of the martyrs. Now think about that for a few moments in a very practical sense. Men and governments have repeatedly sought to annihilate faith in God. Christians have been persecuted mercilessly, tortured ruthlessly. Bibles have been burned. Its messengers have been stoned, boiled in oil, sawn asunder. They've killed its prophets, murdered its followers. You can read Hebrews 11, verses 32 to 38. You get a pretty good picture there, part of it. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Revelation 6, 9 has some more to say about that. Those who gave their lives for Christ. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside ever wait in the sin that so easily besets us, run with patience the race is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, a witness of the martyrs. They did it. They looked unto him until they gave their lives so that you and I might have handed down to us the gospel. This multitude of witnesses who've died for their testimony of Jesus Christ, all held to their principle of love. This impresses me so much. They never retaliated. They never became vengeful. They never rendered evil for good. They never wished calamity for their persecutors. Isn't that amazing? They lived and died in love. Revelations 12, 11, they loved not their lives unto death. They believed the words of Jesus. Now think about this. I say, I believe the Bible because of the witness of the martyrs. Think of the millions of them. They died for it, and they were the best people of their generations. The honorable people, the good people. They weren't the scum. They were the intelligent people, the people that you could count on. And they gave their lives. They died. Why would that many top remarkable people with great honor and dignity, would that many people, thinking people, die for some silly superstition? It don't make sense. They believed the words of Jesus. John 13, 34, that you love one another as I have loved you. John 13, 16 says, the servant is not greater than his Lord. 1 John 3, 16 says, hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, for others. John 15, 13. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life, or a woman lay down her life for his or her friends. Now, this is very simple. When such a multitude of people have laid down their lives in love for their testimony of the gospel, I frankly am very impressed. I would feel like a dummy not to be impressed by that. After all, what is life 
You're taking people's word for things all along. What you go to school for, what you study for, taking somebody's word for it. You're going to be a scientific laboratory technician, run through life and prove everything. You're doing things all the time that you're not proven. I repeat, when such a company, such a multitude of good, sensible people lay down their life for this testimony of Jesus Christ, I am impressed. And I say, you know, I think that would be the finest crowd to imitate. Suppose they're wrong. Am I a fool for following them? I'll live in dignity and honesty. I'll do good. I'll help people. Can love poison people? I'd rather be on that side even if we were wrong. But we're not wrong. It's more than a political, religious case. It has to be something of profound reality, this Jesus thing. Otherwise, so many people wouldn't have taken it. The third reason I believe the Bible's true, non-theological reason, just a simple reason, is because of those who taught the Bible to me. Now you stop and think about that. That's a very good reason for believing the Bible. They were among the finest people in our community. If you're going to believe somebody, who are you going to believe? The riffraff? I don't make sense. I believe the Bible because of the people who taught it to me. I think that's a good reason. I get excited about it. They were not the rapists, the sex perverts, the rioters, the defrauders. They were not the ones who failed to pay their debts, who were dishonest in business. They weren't the ones that revolted or destroyed property. They were the peaceful, good, and loving people in the community, the backbone of the whole society. Isn't that terrific? I could trust them. If I couldn't trust them, who in the world am I going to trust? I believe I can trust them. If you can't trust good people, you're in trouble. But we need to reflect on that when you start asking yourself, is there anything to God? What about all the good, smart, intelligent, fine, principled, dignified, honorable men and women that I believe in God. Tell me they were fools. Tell me they weren't as smart as you. They didn't figure it out and you did. That's hard for me to believe. That's hard for me to believe about me. I like their word. I like their life. They've got a reputation. They laid it on the line. They made it work. They built good lives. They built institutions. They were the strength of the community. I think you can bank on them. They knew how to run businesses. They knew how to make a living. They knew how to keep a family together. And they believed in God. They believed the Bible. They revered it. Suits me. I like it. I hope it makes an impression on you. They would rather die. Those kind of people would rather die than deceive anybody. They just wouldn't do it. Honorable. Honest. They wanted only my good. They didn't want anything to happen to Tommy Osborne, but good. Would they have led me on the wrong road? Never. They were the builders, not the destroyers. They were the hard workers, not the lazy riffraff. Their homes, their lives were clean and pure and loving. There was dignity, you go in their house. Oh, I like that. All of that impresses me. They believed the Bible. They lived by its sacred principles. I could trust them. The fruit of their lives was what I wanted. I got it. I followed them. I believed it. It works. My life's that way. A good life. You can trace our steps back to our beginnings. There's not a debt we ever left unpaid anywhere. Anybody that we ever were conscious of ever having done wrong, we've been back, we've licked our tracks, we've cleaned our steps, we've asked forgiveness. The way's clear back there. You know, it's nice to be honest. You don't have to remember what you said. Things are okay back there. You can check up on any of them. 
You won't find any bad tracks back there. You can trust people like that. You want another reason? The fourth reason I believe the Bible is true. Non-theological. I'm not giving you Bible for this. I want to get you to thinking. If I can get you to thinking, we're going to have fun. <laughs> the fourth reason that I believe the Bible is true is because of the life of Christ. Jesus Christ was a good man. Suppose, maybe not you, but your crowd, the one you go to reach, let's assume that we're not talking about him, the divine son of God. We're not talking about his divinity. We're not talking about all this. We're talking about a non-theological reason to believe the Bible. Jesus, as a historic character that lived, you don't have to read the Bible to know a man called Jesus of Nazareth lived. Roman history tells us all about that. He lived. He's a person in history, see? So now, that man that lived, like Josephus lived, or Aristotle lived, or any reputed character in history, this is the man I'm talking about, the man called Jesus. He was a good man. He was kind and loving. He was a man of peace, a man of good works. He cared for people. He engaged in a constant life crusade to help people find joy and happiness and peace and health and success. That's a lovely person that'll do that. If he isn't divine, I'm profoundly impressed by him. But now I'm looking at him. He advocated principles that are cornerstones of the best and most free societies in history. Jesus did it. He never hated or envied. He never demonstrated revenge or judgment. He loved and healed and helped and encouraged. He identified with those who had no friends. He cured the untouchables and the impossible cases. He loved the most unlovely and blessed the most unworthy. You can't beat that. That's a track record. His rules of life were the most challenging of any leader who ever lived. Luke 6, 31. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Four times the Gospels record Christ's words, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You'll find that in Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine. He said in the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You'll find it in Mark chapter 12, verses 31 to 33. The second is the same, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these, Jesus said and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the soul and with all the strength and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Beautiful, isn't it? Again and again he repeated it. Paul repeated those same terms twice in his letters, Romans 13 verse 4, and then in Galatians chapter 5 verse 14. And all of them were re-quoting the words of Moses in Leviticus 19, verse 18. You know, Moses said, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Jesus said, Do that. A beautiful principle. No leader ever lived by a set of such high and noble principles as this man Jesus. He said, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. This is Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 to 45. Do good to them that hate you. Isn't that terrific? This impresses me. Are you thinking? You see, we can be blase about all this. Just pass it off. Say, oh, I don't believe the Bible. Hold it. This guy, Jesus, terrific thinker. I'm profoundly impressed by him. Do good to those that hate you. 
Boy, that's a revolutionary way of life. I love it. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. He told us our Father was in heaven. He believed in that. Nobody ever caught him in a lie. I think you can trust him. I believe the Bible because of the life of Jesus. Listen, Jesus believed the scriptures. So, I'm so impressed by Jesus, I say, I do too. Because this was a very smart man. He quoted them as being the absolute word of God. He lived by them. He taught them. He proved them. He made them work. And he was such a good man, an honest man, without guile or deceit. I can trust him more than any other teacher I ever knew. That impresses me. When he healed lepers and sick people and raised the dead, they tried to kill him. I don't know why. What would you want to kill a guy for doing that for? <laughs> when cripples walked, they accused him of curing them by the devil's power. Who ever heard of the devil doing something good to people? It don't make sense. It don't make sense. <laughs> when he helped people in need, they plotted his destruction. And even today, in many areas of our world, those who do not believe the Bible are often vehement, violent, ruthless, against the Christian faith, they seem to hate simple, childlike faith and wish its destruction. As though the peace and love and healing influence of Jesus might obstruct their own influence on society. They're still doing it. They've killed millions in China, other countries. I don't understand it. Finally, opposers and haters of the Jesus life told so many lies about him and laid so many plots to destroy him and harangued him and harangued the government about him so relentlessly that they finally succeeded in getting license to kill him and get rid of him. Boy, what a service. How can the devil be that mean? Why does unbelief hate faith so much. Now, we can't become reactionary to that. We just love them and go on and have faith. Throughout the cruel process of his trial and before the myriad false accusations against him, he never retaliated, never became harsh or unkind. In his dying moments, Luke 23, 34 says he prayed for their forgiveness. Isn't that beautiful? Pilate said in Luke 23, verse 4, I find no fault in him. Friends, in this class, I don't either. I can't either. Can you? I believe in him. I can trust him. I can trust what he says. Jesus said that people err not knowing the scriptures. Mark 14 says the scriptures must be fulfilled. Jesus said that. Luke 24, 27, the Bible says, He expounded unto them all the scriptures. Luke 24, verse 32 and verse 45, He opened to the people the scriptures that they might understand the scriptures. He believed the scriptures. He was so good, I think he was right. John 5, 39, Jesus said, search the scriptures. I hope this helps you say, hey, we can trust this book. Jesus did, and he was good. All them other good people did. We can trust them. I got to follow them or some idiot over here, some dummy, some infidel, some rebel, some rioter, some destroyer. What's my choice? My option, my priority. Follow the man that made life succeed, and you'll go to the top. <laughs> Jesus, in Mark 12, verse 10, Jesus asked the religious teachers if they had not read the scriptures. That was his basis. When he did miracles and taught, 
He said several places, John 13, verse 18, he said it. John 17, verse 12, he said it. John 19, verse 24, 28, and 36, he said it. He said that the scriptures might be fulfilled. He believed the scriptures. Ninety times in the New Testament, there are admonitions for us to believe what is written because it's God's word and it'll come to pass. You get that? Ninety times in the New Testament. Jesus proved the scriptures. He proved them. His life, his birth, his death, his resurrection, as well as his teachings and his miracles were foretold in detail hundreds of years earlier in the scriptures. And it came to pass. I can trust that. All that Christ did proved that the scriptures were God's word. God's promises, and that if anyone would trust them and rely upon them, God would fulfill them, which is a very good common sense reason for believing the Bible, especially when weighed against the confusion, the changing conclusions, and the endless quandary of those who reject the Bible. They're changing all the time. You can't follow them. They don't know where they're going. We do. Common sense influences me to trust a man like Jesus and to trust the good, solid pillars of every generation since Christ. Yes, good sense causes me to believe the Bible. I believe the Bible is true because of what happened after the crucifixion. That is very impressive. It begins to get interesting. Acts 1 and 3, after his passion he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. Wow, that gets good, doesn't it? Proofs. That's strong language. The English Living Bible says he appeared from time to time actually alive and proved to them in many ways that it was really he himself they were seeing. <laughs> Isn't that nice? I love that. And the guys that told us they saw him, are we going to call them liars? No. They saw him. They touched him. They talked with him. They watched him eat bread and fish. They examined the scars of the nails and of the spear in his hands and feet and side. They did all of this after he rose from the dead. And his good, reliable people that told us these stories. You can bank on them. Stephen, being cruelly stoned to death for his testimony of Jesus, saw him alive. Saul of Tarsus, the ruthless persecutor of the early Christians who hated their faith with an insatiable lust to kill and destroy them, saw the Lord. Cephas saw him. All the twelve that were chosen, they saw him. Five hundred people saw him at one time. You can read all that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 5 to 7. You can read Paul's case in Acts chapter 9, verses 2 to 8. Then he witnessed before the king in chapter 26, verses 13 to 15, and tells it again. It would be unreasonable that they would all lie. Their lives were reputed for impeccable honesty and uprightness of character. Throughout the 19 centuries that have passed since Christ arose from the dead, an innumerable host of witnesses have recorded their testimonies that the Lord has appeared to them. They saw him alive. Great volumes of books would be required to contain the appearances of Christ. In practically every crusade we've ever conducted, he's appeared. He came in my room. I saw him. I'm honest. T.L. Osborne from Tulsa, Oklahoma, reputed. I don't lie. I'm alive. He came in my room. You can trust him. He believed the Bible. He believed the scriptures. I do too. So next week, let's get into these scriptures and into this book and go for God's best. May his blessing be upon you. I'll see you next week.